welcome to another Sunday here at Ebenezer Church of God. We pray that you have felt, felt the goodness of God all week and that you're ready to celebrate another day in his presence, celebrate another day with him. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. If you're here in the deep metro area, it's snowing outside. But we're going to still have service. We're still going to worship. So shake off the morning blues. Shake off the, the spirit of downness. Shake off whatever is going on in your life. And get ready to worship the Lord. Get ready to praise with us. This morning we're going to go into our consecration song by our praise and worship team. Followed by our scripture reading by Sister Chanel O'Connor. And our prayer by Brother Sion Lopez. today. Romans 12, verses 1 through 21. And it reads thus, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that this, that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than ye ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, 
and all members had not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the portion of faith, or ministry let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth and exhortation he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another without brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Disturbing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecuteth you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be ye of the same mind, one toward one another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your conceits. Recommence to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. 20 verse and last. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We honor God's word by saying, Amen. Praise God. Praise God. that you would uphold and strengthen, that you would deliver, that you would anoint God, that your word can penetrate into the atmosphere. Breaking the chains, oh God, removing the gates of darkness. We ask that you would intervene, that your word will penetrate, oh God, as lightning penetrates, oh God, in, from the atmosphere into the earth, that your word will able to penetrate into the heavens. 
And we ask as we intercede and as we pray and as we sing, God, that everything that is done, God, will bring honor and glory to your name. We ask that you would minister, God, allow our prayers to prevail, oh God, prevail against the forces of darkness. As light will expel, oh God, darkness, so let your word, oh God, expel the strength, the strength, oh God, of darkness. So, oh God, let your word, oh God, and the life of you expel, oh God. The darkness that covers us. As, oh God, lightning comes from heaven and penetrates, so let our prayer penetrate, oh God, into the atmosphere, breaking the gates, oh God, shattering the strongholds and the chains of darkness, that we could penetrate into the atmosphere, that our words could reach the throne room of Jesus. And God, we ask for nothing less. We do not ask for riches, we do not ask for fame, we do not ask for popularity. We do not ask to be recognized by men. But all we seek, O oh God, is the souls of men. That your word, that the spirit of you can, oh God, minister and intervene. Oh God, as light, oh God, from the sun, God, comes and penetrates the earth. That the spirit of you can penetrate into the atmosphere. As the skies, oh God, govern the earth from the east to the west, oh God, from the north to the south. So we ask that, oh God, that the souls of men would come to know you. We commit them into your hand. And we ask for, oh God, nothing more but a revival. We ask for a penetration of your word into the hearts of men. That it would, oh God, minister to their very soul, to their very heart, oh God. We ask that you would touch, touch the souls of men. We ask that you would minister to their hearts. We ask that you would convict, convince, and convert the hearts of men. We know all men will not get saved, but we ask that all men come to the fear, the knowledge, and the understanding of who you are. Even as Egypt, oh God, may not have repented, but they recognize who you are. Even as the nation that was around did not repent, but they recognized the God of Israel. So we ask for the souls of men. We ask for conversion. We ask for the convincing and the converting. We ask for conviction. We ask, oh God, for revival. That the word that is preached, that the songs that are be sung, will minister into the hearts of men, into the homes, oh God, wherever they are. That the spirit of you would convict, convince, and convert the hearts and the minds, that all will give, come to an attention when your word is being spoken by songs, by preaching, or by testimony, even by prayer. We thank you. We thank you. Give us a revival from the north to the south, from the east to the west, to the center of the earth. Touch the nations of this world and shake it as an earthquake will shake and flow. Flow, flow in the hearts of men, flow. We give you all the praise. We give to you all the honor and the glory. We commit it all into your hands and we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. We give God all honor and glory today. This is the day that he has made. And we are gathered again online, at home, and in the sanctuary, or wherever we may be, to give him our praise and to give him our worship. And before we go into the service, um, I just want us to do this song. <laughs> um, send the light. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, 
Um, it says that we are to be salt and light in this world, and a city that's on a hill cannot be hidden. You can't miss it. And God is telling us to be the light to this world that's filled with darkness. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we are to be light to this world. So we just want to encourage you that wherever you are, let the light of God shine through you into this world.
One more time, send the light. called to be salt and light to this world. And those words are just to encourage everybody, even while we are here in this season, in this time, we can still let our light shine. Even though you might be at home, even though you might not be able to shake a hand, even though you may not be able to exchange a warm smile because the mask is over your face, you can still let your light shine into the world of darkness and show somebody today, tomorrow, this week, the love of Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord. Send that blessed gospel light to somebody that you encounter, even if it's a virtual meeting. Your love, that light that God has placed in you can still shine. No matter where you are, you can still make a difference. So take up that mandate and send the light today. God bless you. Hallelujah. And we have much to give God thanks for. In everything the Bible says, give thanks. Hallelujah. That's the will of God. And regardless of the situation that you're in, you can still find something to give God thanks for. There is still light in your situation. Bless God. So we're going to give him thanks today. So join with us. We thank you, God. Even for the snow that's falling here in Maryland, we are grateful because that shows God's faithfulness in the season. Hallelujah. We are here and we are alive and well. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes we take those little things for granted. But we know even in this time, if we haven't learned anything else, is to give God thanks for even the smallest things that we never used to thank him for. This breath that I just took, I'm grateful for. <laughs> My voice is not the most beautiful, but I'm thankful to God that I can raise a hallelujah to him today. I am grateful because I can look at my brothers and sisters, my pastor. He is in good health. The first family is in good health. There are many people that have lost their shepherds due to COVID and other illnesses. But we have our pastor. We have our church. We have this stream. And even though we can't see you, we can still communicate with you today. So we want to tell you God loves you, we love you, and we are grateful for you. We're grateful for this new day that he has made, so we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. So one time before we move forward, wherever you are, let us acknowledge God for his goodness and his faithfulness. If you are thankful, lift up a high praise, lift up a thank you, Jesus, lift up a round of applause. If you can't do anything but shout, just shout as loud as you can. If you can't do anything but pour out tears, just pour them out before your God this morning because we have much to give God thanks for. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Let's take it from the top. Say, give thanks.
shall bow
place, Father God. We give you the honor <laughs> that is due unto you. Then sings my soul unto God in heaven. Glory to God. Yes, Lord. Ah, hallelujah. We come to you this morning just to give you glory, just to give you honor, Father God. Just to give you the praise that is due unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm tasked with welcoming you this morning. So, Father God, before we even welcome Father God, anyone that we would like to take the opportunity to welcome you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the atmosphere this morning. Hallelujah. We give reverence and honor to the bishop of this house, his wife, the lovely Rose, Dr. Rose Sobrian, and their daughter Sharona. We welcome everyone that is in the house with us this morning. Those of you in the parking lot, those of you joining us on social media, we welcome you. Our extended family, you know, Ebenezer is not international. We want to welcome Pastor Titus and his son Lijo, who is worshiping with us from India. Katie, her daughter Sophia, and her mother, who's worshiping with us in Sierra Leone. Brother Roger in Florida, and everyone else that's worshiping with us here in the sanctuary and at home this morning. We welcome you. At this time, we'd like to introduce our pastor who will bring us the tithe and the offering and then immediately following that he'll bring us the word. Good, God is good, God is good. Praise the Lord. We welcome you again this beautiful Sunday morning and it is beautiful even though we have slow out there, but it looks really, 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 really wonderful. God is good. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are in the month of February, and um, it means that Easter is just around the corner. And that's what I have in my mind this morning, Easter. On February 17th, we officially begin the Easter consecration. The Roman Catholic Church calls that uh, Ash Wednesday, and it officially begins the season of Lent in that religion, that culture. Uh, but I want us to embrace that this year. I want us to embrace the season of Lent and benefit from the values that can be obtained in celebrating that event. Four days from February 17th will take us into Easter and the grand resurrection, the celebration, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I am asking you to get ready to join us for four days of consecration. Four days of consecration, beginning February 17th. And we are going to give you some scriptures to read every day and daily devotions which will prepare your mind. From, even from now, I would like to ask you to think of something that you want to fast from, to give up. And it, it, it can be a, a certain type of food. It can be, you know, meat. It could be uh, something else that you really like and you want to give that up. It's, it's a way of reminding yourself that you are on a journey of consecration. So I would like you to think of something from now that you're going to fast from that for four days. Give it up for four days. And during this time, we'll have special devotions and consecration, preparing our hearts for the big day, Good Friday, and an even greater day, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on Easter. I believe this is going to be an Easter with a difference, and we are going to get ready for it. We're going to prepare ourselves for it. We are going to embark on the spiritual journey. So I'm asking you from now to get ready for that. Next Sunday, we will share with you the scriptures and the devotions that you need for this exercise. God bless you. It's time for us to give today. And you know, this is a familiar passage of scripture for me, and I have mentioned it many times. But today, I want to read it for you. And uh, kind of take a minute and explain to you what is the meaning of this scripture. Jacob 
is in Syria. He is in the land of his mom. His, his parents were from this area, his mom. And, uh, and now he, he, uh, he goes back there because of a conflict with his brother, Esau. Now, while he was going to Syria, he stopped at Bethel and had a divine spiritual encounter with God where he saw God in heaven and he saw the angels ascending and descending. He saw this ladder going up. And, uh, and, and he had, it was a very, 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 very eventful, awesome experience for him. So he said, I'm going to change the name of this place. It was called Luz, and then he said, I'm going to call it Bethel. And he put the stone and poured some oil, and he made a vow. He says, Lord, if you will take me on this journey that I don't know where I'm going and what's going to befall me, if you will take me there, and you will provide for me. And you notice that the things that he was asking for was food and clothing, simple things. If you'll provide this for me, then this stone will become your house. I will build a house here for you. And everything that you gave me, I will give back a tenth. That's where he made the vow of tithes. So when he went, not only did God provide him with food and clothing, but God blessed him. God blessed him beyond his employer's blessing. You know, Laban tried to rob him. In fact, Laban robbed him ten times. Ten times. Every time Laban changed his wages, reduced, the harder he worked is the less money he got. I don't know if you know someone would do that today and get away with it. But that's what Laban did. When Laban saw how God was blessing him, Laban reduced his salary. Not only did Laban see that, Laban said, I know that God blessed me because of you, because you have a blessing upon your life. So after 10 times changing his wage, God spoke to Jacob. 10 times is over. He paid a tenth in tithes, and the 10th time, now I, I, I like to think all his benefits are expiring. So what happens when your benefit is expired? When the blessing of your tithes is expired? Here's what God does for him. Here's what God did for him, and here's what God will do for us. Let, let me read Genesis chapter 31 and verse 12 and 13. It says, look up, he says, and see that all the males that are mating with the flock are straight and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban have done to you. And verse 13 is the important verse, he says. For I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and you made a solemn vow unto me. Now get up and leave this land at once and return to your native land. So God told him, say, you know what? I am the God of Bethel. I am the God that you made the pledge to, that you will tithe and you will build a house. You will give offering to build a house, take care of my house. And because you did that, that's why I blessed you. And I come back to tell you, it's time to go. It's time to go. I have blessed you enough here. I want you to go. And I'm going to also restore you with your brother. And God did that. God did that more. And now... Jacob is the father of all the Jews, of all Israel, and Israel is blessed beyond measure simply because one man made a vow and kept it. And that vow had to do with tithes and offerings. I know folks today who have made vows like that and have kept it over the years, and God has blessed them tremendously. Uh, I want to ask you to trust God and do the same. Make a vow in your heart today to do the right thing. And you can't go wrong when you do the right thing. I know many of you have been tithing, and God bless you for it. And I know some are still not sure whether this is the right thing to do. Remember Jacob. Remember who Jacob was. Remember who Jacob is today, the most blessed nation in all the world, because they tithe. I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for you and pray for the offering that you're giving today, that God would bless it tremendously. And as you're giving in the offering, also remember your tithes. You can use our cash app, or you can use our PayPal account, or you can drop it off at church. It doesn't matter. I am praying that God will bless you. Would you bow your hearts with me? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we come before you believing and trusting in you that you are the God of Bethel, the God who honors promises and vows, the God who honors his word and keeps his covenant to many generations. I pray today, God, that you will bless us and help us in the midst of this journey that, Lord, you will rebuke the devourer and restore what was lost, what was taken away in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your giving. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. We do appreciate your faithfulness, uh, especially during this time. And I know that God will reward you. I, I've, get, I've gotten calls many times. Folks want to know how can they tie because they, they don't have access to electronics and social media and literally they don't pay bills or anything like that online. Many don't know how. Well, give us a call and we will, one of the elders will come and assist you in this. Um, we, we want you to do the right thing that you want to do as well. So God bless you. God bless you as you think about that. I, I, I want us to go into the word of God today, but before we do, let's pray. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this great opportunity that we have to come into your presence and share your word. We thank you for this great privilege that we have that we can unwrap the scriptures and see what is in your mind and in your heart for us during this time. I give you thanks and praise and honor and glory for your good and loving and kind and merciful God. Bless us today, Lord, and minister to us from your word, I ask in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me go into the upper room here for a little bit. You know, I, I believe I've preached from this message before. I've preached from this scripture before, most certainly. But somehow in my spirit, I feel God is leading me back here again. God is definitely leading me back here uh, on this passage of scripture. And I would like us to visit again the book of Amos, the prophet Amos, chapter 4 and verse 12. It simply says, Amos is writing, he says, therefore thus will I do unto thee, he's speaking to Israel, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. These are the words of the prophet Amos to the children of Israel. We honor God's word by saying, Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be his word without end. Amen. Now, before we go into the message itself, let me uh, take a minute out here to describe to you who wrote this, and why it was written, where it was written, and to whom it was written, and what are the circumstances that surround it. So you have a better understanding of the text itself. The prophet Amos. Amos, the prophet Amos. Amos was one of the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. An older contemporary of Hosea and Isaiah. So they were around the same time period. Amos was active during 760 to 755 uh, BC, about five or six years his ministry lasts. Uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II, Jeroboam II, they call, he's called Jeroboam II because he is the second king uh, that had the same name. The first Jeroboam was a servant to Solomon who was exiled in Egypt, and he came back and led the ten tribes away from Israel to the north and participated in dividing the kingdom of, of Israel. 
and, and the, at that time, he, he encouraged the, the Jews to worship in the north. He tried to prevent them from going back to the temple in Jerusalem because he felt if they had gone back to the temple in Jerusalem, then they would be reunited again somehow. So he kept them to the north. He built a temple in Dan, the farthest city to the north, as far away as you possibly could go, away from Jerusalem. And then he built another city in Bethel, and another temple in Bethel, and that's where they worshipped. They worshipped gods that were made of stone and wood, gods that were shaped like calves and different other animals. So he really led Israel astray, the Jeroboam the first. He was, uh, so, so the Amaziah, Amos here, is prophesying during the reign of the second Jeroboam, who was just like the first. So you have an idea of what's going on here. He was, Amos was from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he prophesied and he preached in the north. So he was like a missionary, sorrow, a missionary that left one country to another to preach the gospel. Now let's talk a little bit about his writings. What did Amos, what did he write? Amos wrote at a time of peace and prosperity of Israel, but also at a time of neglect of Yahweh's law. He spoke against the increased disparity between the very wealthy and the very poor. His major themes were social justice, God's omnipotence, and divine judgment. And this is also uh, the theme of many of the other prophets. They, they, they really spoke about this several times. So you understand now that the time in which Amos is preaching, Israel is prosperous. That's a northern kingdom. They just conquered their eastern neighbors of Syria and Moab and Ammon and took back all of the land east of the Jordan River that was taken away from them by Syria. So the land east of the Jordan River that was watered by the fresh water of the Jordan River was very fertile and prosperous. So this is a time when Israel enjoyed tremendous wealth. Very, very, very wealthy. Under the reign of Jeroboam II. And you understand that while they're enjoying this prosperity, they forgot God. They forgot Yahweh. And they worshipped the God of stone and wood. That's Amos. Let's talk about his king. Well, I said, I said a lot about this king already, but let's read what the scripture said about him in 2 Kings 14. And in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam II, that's the one who's reigning during the time of Amos, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. Very long reign he had. 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. That's the Jeroboam I spoke to you about earlier, who was a servant in the court of King Solomon. So just to get a little picture of what is going on here. Jeroboam II is king. He's reigning in the north, the ten tribes to the north in Israel, and he's reigning during a very prosperous time. He was a great military general. And of course, he led Israel into battle, conquered, restored the borders of Israel to the east, and established prosperity and wealth in the nation. During the same time, they experienced spiritual degradation and spiritual decline, where they forgot completely about God and they worship idols. Now, there was not a prophet in Israel that could tell the king he was wrong. You see, because the king established this little temple that he built at Bethel, of all the places, Bethel, which is the house of God, he built the temple there. And then he put an image. He put an image to worship these gods of stone and wood. And then he raised up his own prophet by the name of Amoziah. And he paid him. Amoziah was paid by the king, King Jeroboam. Paid to tell him everything that he wanted to hear. So there was no one telling them anything. There was no one preaching the truth. There was no one giving direction. So God raised up a farmer from the south. His name is Amos. 
He was not a prophet. He was not the son of a prophet. Back in those days, the only way you could be a prophet is if your father was a prophet. The only way you could be a priest is if your father was a priest. And those were the two lines of spiritual guidance in all of Israel. The priest came from priestly line. The prophet came from the prophetic line. But here God just, just tossed all those laws aside. And he went out into a field to a man who never went to Bible school. Who never had any spiritual training or education. All he was is a farmer of Tekoa and gatherer of sycamore fruit. That's all he was. That's all he knew. But while he was out there in the field, God spoke to him and gave him a word and said, leave the south and go to the north and preach to the king, King Jeroboam II, and tell him that God is going to judge him. Tell him that God is going to bring this land into judgment for all the wickedness that they, that they were doing. And the wickedness that God was speaking about here is social injustice. That is, they were respecter of persons. They were looking at the way people dress and the way they look and among the money they had. And the, the rich were given privileges and they were treated better and the poor were looked down upon. They were judged because of their social standing, because of where they came from, because of the color of their skin, because of their family heritage. And, you know, the society was all corrupt and unfair. And it's, it's heartening and it's encouraging to know that God pays attention to those things. God pays attention to when the poor is taken advantage of. God pays attention to when justice is absent. Whether it's social justice or political justice or financial justice. Justice in any way. Anytime people are oppressed and taken advantage of, when they are helpless, God pays attention to it. Even if they're not helpless, God pays attention. So God raised up this prophet, give him a word. And in fact, God raised up this farmer, give him a word, made him a prophet, and sent him to the north. Say, go preach to those people. And guess what? He made the mistake of going to preach in the king's church or the king's temple. And right away, he was preaching a message that went contrary to all that they hold there. Someone came into that church and upset everything by telling them, you ought to serve Jehovah. You ought to serve the true and the living God. And what you're doing is wrong. And very often people are very upset when they hear messages like that in church. They don't like to hear it. But I want to let you know, sometimes we need to hear it. Sometimes That's the only way we will walk in the straight and narrow. That's the only way we'll be able to put our lives in check. Is that we have to hear the truth of the gospel. We have to hear the truth of what is in the mind of God. I don't want to go to a church where the pastor will always tell me things I want to hear. I mean, how good is that going to be for us? How are we going to change when all that we hear are good things about yourselves? But make no mistakes, people don't like to hear bad things about themselves. And it's not something that is pleasant, pleasant to, the he to the hearing, but it's necessary nevertheless. But, you know, Amos found himself in a very peculiar situation. And as he was preaching, the priest and the prophet that was paid by Jeroboam II heard his sermon and confronted him. I said, hey, buddy, if it's food you want, we don't have any food here for you. Go back to your country and eat bread, for we don't have nothing to give you here. You know, he felt that Amos went over to the north because of their prosperity. He felt that Amos was poor, which he probably was. And needy, and he came over looking for some money. Not every preacher is looking for money. Not every preacher is looking for bread. There are still some who is determined and possessed with a passion to speak, thus said the Lord, regardless of the consequences. And thank God for a man like Amos, who did not care what people think or say. He had one thing in mind, and that was to obey God and speak the truth. He's not after his money. 
And Amos had to, had to answer him. Amos answered him. You know, he, said, he told Amos, he said, get out, go back. They chased him out of the temple, you know. And Amos stood up and said, listen to me, man. I am not the prophet. I am not a son of a prophet. I wasn't born a prophet. My prophecy came from God. But I am a, I am a farmer of Tekoa and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. But while I was out there in the field, God gave me a word, and it was God who sent me here. Not for your money, not for your bread, not for your wealth, but to deliver my soul. Hallelujah. And he said to him, Thus said the Lord, I will do something in Israel that you have never heard of before. And because I will do this, you, Amaziah, and you, Jeroboam, and all the nation of Israel, prepare to meet your God, for you are going to meet him. Now, I got I to gotta finish off this little story quickly before I go into the rest of the message to tell you that they did not heed the words of Amos. They chased him away, and he eventually left. But he did not leave before he delivered his soul. And he told him, God is going to meet you. And you better get ready to meet him. And this comfortable nation, who defeated their enemies to the east, who recovered their land, who planted and experienced tremendous prosperity and wealth, got a visit from the north this time. They defeated the east, so the north, Assyria came instead. They defeated Syria, and here comes Assyria. That's a northern kingdom of Iran, Iraq, and parts of Turkey. Massive area today. Like present-day Iran, present-day Iraq, and upper Mesopotamia, parts of Turkey. That's the Assyrian Empire. And they came marching south. They came marching south. And got all of the Israelites, all of the ten tribes, and carried them away into captivity. God says, if you don't change, I will bring judgment upon you. You are strong militarily. You are strong in your military might and power that you can defeat your enemy. You can rescue your lands. You can plant your crops. You can have material and financial prosperity. But listen, if I made an appointment to meet you, you are going to meet with me for sure. And they did. Now, I'm, I'm talking to you today because I want you to avoid that encounter. Or when the encounter comes, I want you to be ready for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there are two things I want to talk to you about here. And a little bit in between. The first thing is that you will meet with God. That's number one. We all will meet with God at one time. And the next thing which I want to see happen is you will be happy that you are prepared to meet with him. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to know that when you meet with God, you're glad? You're actually looking forward to it? And you know that everything is well with your soul, and you're glad for that moment in time. So they got a few things in between that we've got to do. So let's take a look at it. Number one, you will meet with God. Number two, you will give an account to him when you meet him. Number three, you need to prepare. You need to get ready. Number four, you, you need to learn how to prepare. You see? There's a, there's a way to do this, and I will teach you how to do that today. And finally, this thing all, all ends where you meeting with God, and it is a wonderful, glorious meeting that you are glad and happy about. So, how, how do we get prepared? Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 15. Here's what the wise man said. Solomon said this. Sometime in, in his last days, when he's about to give up the kingdom, and he is old and wiser than before, and he's thinking about his life, and here's what he says. He's also thinking about death. Death is in his mind, and here's what he said. Then I said in my heart, he's thinking, as it happened to the fool, so it happened even to me. He said, the fool who don't know anything, get is getting old, and he's dying, just like me. 
We are, and I am wealthy and I'm wise. And the same thing happened to me. He's thinking about it. So it happened that even to me. And why then was I more wise? What good is my wisdom and my wealth when the poor man is dying and I am also dying? He's thinking about this. What is, what is important here? Then I said in my heart, this is also vanity. So he's saying here in his, his last days, my wealth and my wisdom cannot save me from the reality of death. He's understanding that I am dying. That is the common denominator of all flesh. We are all dying. I wish I can say that differently, but that's the best way I can think about saying it. We are all dying. From the moment we are born, our cells are dying. You know, they are replaced uh, every so often, and then, you know, they're replaced, but they're not as good as the ones that were there before. Until finally, you know, we, we, we go home. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 doesn't leave anything up to the imagination. It says it clearly. The Apostle Paul, I believe, who wrote Hebrews, he says, And it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. That is very clear language. Paul says, we all have an appointment to keep, and that appointment is death. So it's an appointment. It's a time when we will meet with God. We will, we will answer the call, and what happens at that meeting is what I want to talk to you about here today. In Revelation 20 and verse 12, we don't have to imagine because the word tells us. He says, and I saw the dead... Small and great stand before God, and the books are open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. Very clear. John says, I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. They stand before God in his mind. He saw this is not something that, 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 that was imagined. This is something that he literally saw happen. God allowed him to see the event. And he said in this event, all the dead, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the popular and those that no one knew, they all stood before God. That is an appointment we all have to keep. One of these days, after this life is gone, we will stand before a living God to give an account of the things we have done. And John said they were judged out of those things written in the books. Hmm? He says, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged not out of the book of life, but out of the things that are written in the other books. Now, we didn't say here what was the other books, but I have a strong suspicion that the other books is called the 66 books of the Bible. <laughs> From the Old Testament 39 and the New Testament 27 put together, making the book of books. Amen? The book of books, and that's the book that will judge us, John says. We will be judged out of the things written in the book. So whatever is written in the book will stand against us in judgment. If the book says you must not steal, that will stand. Why you steal? Oh, it is what is written in the book. If it says you must not uh, covet your neighbor's property, then you'll have to give an account of it. You must not commit fornication. You must not commit adultery. You must not lie or cheat or steal or bear false witness. You must not forsake the assembling of yourselves. You must worship the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your spirit. Whatever is in the book will stand in judgment against us. Not what society determines. Not what society says. Not is what not, not the style of the day or the order of the day or what is built in the, in the imaginations of the minds of men. That is not going to judge us on the last day. But those things that are written in the word of God. So I encourage you today, let us 
allow ourselves to be guided by the book. Let us live by the book. Let us walk by the book. Let us talk by the book. Let us allow the book to shape our very destiny. For it is the Bible that will stand against us in judgment one day. Amen. It is the book of all books. It is a soldier's sword. It is a sailor's compass. It's a traveler's map. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It will, it will destroy all those who trample with this golden contents. It will stand against us in judgment and it will liberate us and set us free. Hallelujah. Thank God he has given to us his word we call the Bible. Cherish it, read it, but most of all, obey it. Hallelujah. There's no other book like it. Whenever man is serious about doing the right thing and obeying the, the truth, they bring a Bible and they say, put your hand on this and tell us that you will speak the truth. Because it is a symbol of truth like no other book. It stands for truth and righteousness. And that's the book, John says, will go before us in judgment. So we will, we will stand there, you know, so, and give an account. David, David's son, Solomon wrote this. He says, Rejoice, O young man, Ecclesiastes 11. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So Solomon, again, looking back at his life, he said, When you are a young man, when you are young, when you are in this life, enjoy it. If you see something that you like, take it. If you see something that you need, take it. When I say take it, I mean buy it, you know. <laughs> Don't take it uh, by force. Whatever you can afford in this life. Solomon is big on that. He says, look, whatever God has blessed you with, enjoy it. It is your portion with God. There is nothing better, he says, than for a man to eat, drink, and enjoy the fruit of his labor. For this also is a gift from God, the wise man said. He says, but in doing all of this, in enjoying your music, enjoying what you eat, what you drink, where you live, what you do, what you buy, what you sell, where you have fun, where you don't have fun, in doing all of these things to satisfy yourself, Remember one thing, he says. But no, for all these, God will bring you into judgment. So God is going to ask you, why one day? There's nothing wrong in having fun, but have holy, righteous fun. There's nothing wrong in enjoying your life, but ensure that when you're doing that, that you don't break the laws of God. And don't let anyone fool you, you know. That's how if you become a Christian, then you, your life, your joy is forever gone. Oh, no, my friend. If you get saved, then you will not be happy anymore. Whoever said that to you did not tell you the truth. For it is after you get saved, that's when you really begin to enjoy your life. That's when you really know true happiness. For on the only true joy that a man or a woman can have is what comes from God. Amen? He is the true joy of life. And he gives true joy and true happiness in the lives of his believers. You, you, don't, you don't know true happiness until you know the one that comes from God himself. Don't let anyone tell you if you go to church you won't be happy. It's not true. And those who know God will tell you, I, I go to church because I, I'm happy when I go home. I worship God because as I'm worshiping him, it brings joy in my heart. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. It is a true and divine and sincere and righteous, pure worship and adoration to God that brings peace and joy and happiness in your life. And you can be happy and you will be happy and you will be joyful from worshiping and praising God in a pure and holy and righteous way. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The wise man is beginning to think about this thing. He said, you know, I did some things that I probably shouldn't do. 
I, you know, <laughs> I went some places I probably shouldn't go. And I allow myself to indulge too much in the worldly things to satisfy my flesh. And now I'm realizing, look, that is not really what life is all about. It's about my service to God. That's what true happiness is all about. Here's what Matthew says in Matthew 12 and verse 36. Matthew is writing, he says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now this here really scares me. That not only are we going to give an account for the things we do, but we're also going to give account for the things we say. The things we say. So I want to stop right here, and I want to call us all on notice today. To say, watch your words. Do like what Job said. Lord, I set a watch over my eyes. I set a watch over my mouth. Put a watch over my mouth that I will not speak foolishly. Put a watch over my mouth that my words will not hurt others. That my words will not destroy others. That my words will not give God disdain or disrespect. That my words will only glorify God. You know, put a watch over my word, put a watch over my mouth that I will speak words that come from God, that I will think what I speak because words are powerful, amen? So the Bible says that we will give an account of the things we say. And you and I both know that we said some things during our life that we should not have said. We spoke some words that we should not have spoken. We, we did some things that we should not have done. We, 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 you know, we allow ourselves the liberty to speak loosely. Can I let you know today that God will judge us for those things? So when you hear someone coming talking about someone else, trying to disdain them and discourage them and destroy them and kill them with their words, don't participate in that. It's, it's, you know, we are very tempted, very tempted to listen, very tempted to participate, but I'm encouraging you not to be a part of that. Think, uh, think first, how does God get glory over the information I'm receiving right now? And I told you several times, a, a few weeks ago, months ago, maybe a year ago, about how I deal with this, and I, I think it's important for me to say here again. If someone calls me, and, uh, and, and they're, I can see clearly that their intent is to tear down someone else, you know, you know what? You know how I, you know how I take care of that. I say, I say to them, very respectfully. I said, you know, my brother or my sister, I don't believe that this conversation here is giving God any glory. And every time it works, every time the, the conversation stops right there. If what someone is saying to you is not giving God glory, but is destroying a brother or a sister. I don't think you should allow it to continue. Because we will give an account of everything we say. If you don't want to do that, what I told you, then you can read the scripture to them. <laughs> say, my brother, my sister, here's what Matthew 12, 36 says. But I say unto you that every idle word that you speak, you shall give an account in judgment. I bet that will drive the fear of God in their heart. I promise you. I promise you it would. Then there is judgment for the church too. You know, the church doesn't escape this. Here's what 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive his due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So the, the saints will stand before the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ to give an account of the bad things we did while we were Christians in church. Am I getting that right? Christians do bad things in church. It, it just don't sound right to me. But listen, believe me, it is right. There's a lot of bad things going on right in church. There's a lot of evil that is going on right among the people of God. And many times we are tempted to just do whatever you want, say whatever you want, because you think that God is not looking or you think there are not going to be any repercussions. But here's what it says here in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, all of us, 
must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things you have done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And I believe Paul. You know why? Because the Bible says Paul was caught up into the third heaven and saw things that he was not allowed to utter. He saw the heaven of heavens, and maybe God gave him a, a glimpse of what the judgment seat of Christ was like and who was standing there and who was receiving the judgment and what the whole judgment situation was like. Amen? So maybe he got a glimpse of that. He had the authority. He had the knowledge, he had the know-how, he had the experience to write like this, and I believe it, amen? So let's be careful as Christians. If everything I do, I'll be judged for it. Let's be careful. Everything I do in the church, and here's, here's, here's a good measurement to help us to be careful, to walk the straight and narrow, to understand that whatever we do must be done from our heart, for that's what God judges, our heart our intentions, why we did it, why we did what we did, and why we do what we do, and why we are doing what we are doing. Is it to make people talk good about us? Is it to make us look good? Is it the, the, a repetition of the Ananias and Sapphira syndrome? Or is it really to glorify God? And you ask yourself that question, if it means to glorify God, then Continue doing it. Hallelujah. Here's what Revelation 21 says. Revelation 21 verse 8. It says, But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and the liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is the end of those who commit these things and others that are not mentioned in this verse. Their end is in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And that is what the Word of God says. When we meet before God, these are the things that will happen. Either you go into the promise of His goodness or you perish. So there are two judgments. And I want to, I think I need to make it clear here before I go on further. There's the judgment of God the Father. And uh, when you stand before him, it's not to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. But when you stand before him, it's decide the severity of your punishment. And that judgment is a judgment of condemnation. And the other judgment is what Paul wrote about that we read earlier, where he said, well, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment for the church. And all of our works that was not good will be burnt up like hay and stubble and wood. And only what is done for Christ will last. And that determines how much blessing we have in heaven. For I don't believe God is a socialist. He does not, everybody doesn't get the same thing totally. We all get to go to heaven, but the, the degree of our rewards is very different for each individual. Very different. And I know there's some saying, Pastor, I don't care as long as I make it in. Well, I agree. But don't just try to make, you know, when you, when you try to barely make it, what happens? <laughs> A lot of times when you try to just barely make it in before they close the door, many times you don't make it. But if you plan to be there an hour ahead of time or two hours ahead of time, you have a good chance of making it in. Don't, don't try to barely make it. Don't try to barely, don't live as if you just want to barely make it in because very often you don't get there at all. Be careful about that. Hallelujah. Amos 4 and verse 12. I want to read this again. It says, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God. That's what this message is about today. Now, look, here's, first of all, we talked about who will meet with God. You will meet with God. We all will. Uh, you will give an account unto God for the things you have done in this body, whether it's before the judgment seat of Christ or whether it's before the judgment seat of our Lord God, Almighty Jehovah. And you've got to be prepared. Now, I, I can't tell you to prepare without telling you how to prepare. So, you will need to learn how to prepare. Two things I would like to show you. 
how to prepare. Draw near to God, number one. And number two, confess your sins to him. Simple preparation. Just two things you need. Two things you need. First of all, draw near. It, before, we can, before we can correct ourselves, here is the first thing we've got to do. The scripture tells us, humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. First thing. If a man say that he does not have any sin, he deceive himself, and the truth is not in him. And that refers to all men. You know, I, I talk to people all the time, and, and, you know, some will say, Pastor, I'm a good person. I don't do these crazy things that the church preaches against. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't uh, bear false witness. I live a decent moral life. But that will not take you to heaven. The Bible says that the only way to heaven is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord says, I am the door. I am the door of the sheepfold. You cannot get in unless you go through the door. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Those are the words of Jesus. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son. You've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before you can make it in. I know what you believe. I know what people say. I, I know all the arguments, but listen to me. There is no other way. There is no other way to get into the Father but by the Son. You know, I remember reading an illustration once about this, this fire, this fireman. And he went to a, a, a three-story apartment building, and, and there was a fire in that building. The entire building was engulfed with flames. And, he, you know, he was in this bucket truck with this ladder that extended all the way and up to the top. And, you know, he had his hose, and they were trying to extinguish the fire. Uh, some of the firemen went into the building, but they could not get up the stairs because of the smoke and the fire. They, they, had, to, they had to leave the building. And th there was a fire extinguisher on the a fire uh, ladder on the outside, emergency escape or emergency uh, exit, which was a, a metal ladder. I don't know why they make it out of metal. That's probably the best thing they can make it from. That, will not, that takes a long time to, uh, to, to melt and to burn up. But the, the disadvantage with that is that in a fire, it becomes very hot. So the, the emergency fire escape ladder was piping hot. And the firemen knew that there was a woman trapped on the third floor in her apartment. She was looking through the window and waving, calling for help. So he raised his bucket truck raised the bucket, and got to the window. There is smoke inside. There's fire inside. The only way she could breathe is by sticking her head through the window. And he said to her, the bucket is right next to the window. But because it is extended so far, it, it kind of is swaying a little bit, you know. It doesn't look stable. It's kind of waving, wavering, wavering, and it looks unstable. And the woman is inside in the apartment, and she's looking through the window. And the fireman said, you got to come on, climb through the window and come on. Come, you know, come on, come, come into my, in my bucket. Let, let me take you down. And she said, no, I can't do that. I cannot do it. I don't have the courage to do it. Can I, can I use the fire escape? The, the fireman said, it is hot. You will not survive on the fire escape. You cannot go back through the stairways because it's filled with smoke. You will not survive. You will not get down to the bottom. The only way that you can save your life is stepping out of that window into this bucket so I can take you down. You said, I'm scared. I can't do it. He said, listen, that's the only way. And I don't have time to stay here and wait on you all day. You got to make up your mind. This is the only way to save your life. Eventually, she did. She climbed through the window, and he held her hand, pulled her into the bucket, and, and rescued her. But th that was the only way out. And just like that woman who only had one opportunity and one way to save her life, it's the same way to get to heaven. There is only one way, not 
many ways that lead to God. There is one way that lead to eternal life, and that is through the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He came and he died and he gave his life a ransom for you that today you can come and accept him into your heart and enjoy the pleasures of this world in heaven forever and ever and ever. Heaven is a, a place full of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. It's a wonderful place to be. Can you imagine what will happen to those who reject the Son of God? Listen, let's, 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 let's reason this out for a minute. God sent his only son to go through all the degradation and the embarrassment and the shame that, and the ridicule and the persecution and eventually death that Jesus went through just to rescue us from sin. And if we turn our backs upon him and walk away and say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. He's just an ordinary man. Paul tells us, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, if God spared not his only son, but allowed his son to go through all of that ridicule and punishment to rescue us and we turn our backs upon him and walk away. I think that's a dangerous game you're playing if you want to do it that way. You will need to learn how to prepare. And here's how you prepare. Proverbs. Solomon again is speaking. Here's what he says. He says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper. But whosoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Solomon, he discovered this, you know. He discovered that he did a lot of wrong things in his life. But towards the end of his life, he, he figured out something that is worth more than all the gold that he had. Something that is worth more than all the riches that he acquired over the years. He said, there's something powerful I discovered. You know what that was? If I come to God and say I'm sorry, he forgives me. It's that simple. If I confess my sin before him, he will abundantly pardon me. Hallelujah. I want to share that truth with you today and ask you to do what the psalmist said in Psalms 32 and verse 5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Oh, gosh. The psalmist is telling us again that if we confess our sins to God, he forgives us. How can we just not use that great privilege? How can we not use that wonderful opportunity that God has given us? You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go into punishment. You don't have to suffer all of the terrible consequences I told you about before. It is not God's will that this should happen to you. God did not make hell and the lake of fire for people, for mankind and all. It was made for the devil and his angels. It was not designed for us. It has no accommodation for us. Amen? God made heaven for you. God made the place called heaven for you. And it's very simple. All you've got to do is to confess your sins and your faults before God and you will have mercy. Solomon's father wrote this. You know, and he found out this about God himself. David. David said in Psalms 51, this is after he had committed sin with Bathsheba and killed Uriah and, you know, made that terrible mess with his family. It was a terrible situation in Israel. And, and in his repenting, he wrote the psalm, Psalm 51. Here's what he says. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And he went on later and said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So in the midst of this terrible thing that David did. He found peace. He found reconciliation. He found refuge. But he found it in his confession. In his confession, he came to God and said, have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness. Lord, I know you are loving. I know you are kind. I know you are merciful. And I know I did wrong. I come and I acknowledge my sin before you. I acknowledge that I did something wrong and I beg you for forgiveness. And David said he found mercy, he found forgiveness in God. 
But he had to do it the right way. In verse 3, here's what he says. I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. So even though David had done wrong to people, he had done wrong by Bathsheba, he had done wrong by Uriah, but it eventually translated into doing wrong by God. God takes it personal when we hurt our brothers and our sisters. Did you know that? God takes, God takes it personal when we hurt the poor. God takes it personal when we hurt each other. God takes it personal when we wrong each other. God takes it personal when we live in sin and just act as if we don't care. God takes that personal. And we have to understand that every sin is a sin against God. That's when David received forgiveness. When he realized, Lord, I have sinned against you. I have wronged you. I have walked away from your laws and your statutes. And I beg you for mercy and forgiveness today. I implore you. I ask you. I beseech you. I beg you. Regardless of where you are, I would I, I'd like to ask you, please come before God. Acknowledge where you are. Acknowledge what you do. Do not allow pride to fill your heart. And, you know, I know the arguments that some people put up. That, you know, all of this is just something that came out of the fragment of the imaginations of men. They wrote this to kind of keep us under subjection and kind of keep us in slavery and all the different things. Now, listen, I don't have time today to build a case for the Bible. But I'm telling you, if so many people can write the same thing and not contradict each other, and so many incidents, inc incidents of this scripture being stated all over the Bible, if Jesus himself can say this, if the, if the prophets can say this, if all the word of God comes together saying the same thing, then there's got to be some truth to it. In fact, there's got to be all truth to it. It goes together with the nature of God. It goes together with who God is. He's a righteous God. He's a merciful God. He's a just God. And I know you believe that. I know you believe God is righteous and just and merciful and kind. Well, believe that if you confess your sins to him, if you acknowledge him as God, then there is no need for you to suffer any ill will. God did not create you to live for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years on this earth. God created you to live forever. God made you to last forever. It was God's intent. It is God's desire. It is God's will that death will not destroy your body. Your soul will live forever and reunited back with a glory glorious body to live and reign forever in a place called heaven, in a brand new earth forever and forever and forever in eternal bliss. That is the will of God. It's not God's will for anyone to go to hell. But here, this is the key that unlocks the door of heaven. This is the key. I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee alone have I sinned. And I'm speaking to the church I'm speaking to all of us as well as I'm speaking to the world. Not because you're a Christian means that you don't, you've never done wrong. Not because you're a Christian means that you did not sin at some time. And I want to ask you to put away your pride today. Put away your pride. Put away your pride. This is the matter between you and God alone. So put away your pride and say like David, I acknowledge my transgression. And my sin is ever before thee, before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And then when you've done that, I, I've got, I got to close. I'm coming to the end. James chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. If I'm talking to someone today who's standing at the fence, who don't, really know what to do, here is what James says, the brother of Jesus, right? He said, don't be double-minded. Don't want to do it and not want, not want to do it. Make up your mind today. Have one mind, one heart, and purpose in your heart to do what the Word of God says. Acknowledge your sin. And ask God to forgive you and move it away. 
draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. Get rid of it. Wash it. Throw it away. Make, make up your mind one mind today. As of today, I will live for God. As of today, I will serve God. As of today, I have a made up mind. I will go all the way, all the way with my Savior. I renounce the past. I renounce my past. I renounce my old life. I say goodbye to the world and all its pleasures. And today, I renew my covenant with God to live for Him and serve Him. Have mercy upon me, O God. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me from iniquity. Wash me and purge me. I renounce everything evil and I embrace you, oh God. Help me to live a godly, holy, righteous life that I will make it in to see your face. If you, if you will do that, here's all that happens. I will close. This is my closing. If you, if you would renounce the past and embrace a life with God, Jesus himself says, what will happen in the end? Matthew 25 and verse 23. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. God is waiting to say that to you. Well done. Can he say that now? Can God look upon our lives and say, you did well? You know, only you can answer that question. I, I, I can't answer it for you. and I don't want to. I don't want to judge you. I'm not your judge. I'm just the preacher of the word. But I want you to look upon your own life and ask yourself, can God look at me and say, you did well? I think not. I think all of us can say at some point, I didn't really do the right thing every time. But I want to. I want to. And I want to make a change today. I want to make a change today. You know why? That's my last scripture. This is my last scripture I'm going to read now. Very last one. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. This is what it will look like in your life when you stand before God after you have accepted him. After you're willing to humble yourself and do what I ask today, this is the end of your life. It's, it's also in the Bible. Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Hallelujah. That's the end of your life when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the end of your life when you live a life for God. That's the end of your life when you have Allow God to come into your life and rule and guide and lead you in righteous path. You will stand before him. He will, you will see his arms open and you will hear his words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord, the joys of your Lord. What a word, what a proclamation, what a promise, what an event. I want you to be there. I want you to stand before God, not as a judge that will send you to hell. No, that's not what God wants to do. Here is what God wants to do. He wants to send you into the eternal bless of a place called heaven. John saw it. John said, I saw the city. It's a city that lies four square, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high, over 300 feet thick with gates of pearl and walls of jasper and streets of gold, 12 foundations made from precious stones, a city that lies four square, where in the center of the city there is a throne, and someone is sitting upon that throne, 
from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away and there were angels and cherubims and cherubims singing around the throne flying around the throne saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty the whole earth is filled with his glory there was a river that flowed from that throne way down to the middle of that city and there are trees on either side the trees that bears a different fruit each month whose leaves are for the healing of the nations and i said john said i saw a multitude that no one can number all the saints robed in white standing before the throne standing by the banks of the river with joy and happiness white robes golden slippers enjoying the blessed of god no more tears no more sorrow no more pain no more death no more sickness no more heartaches for the former things are passed away and the lord says behold i make all things new that's your end that's what god wants to give you today hallelujah It's not a fairy tale. John said I saw it. I measured it. It's real. John saw it, Paul saw it. Jesus spoke about it. It's not a made up story. That's what God wants you to have. But it all begins with your humility and your confession. I want to pray for you now. I pray for you today. Amos says, prepare to meet your God. But it don't have to be a bad thing. It don't have to be a sad meeting. It can be a glorious meeting. I heard the words of George Washington, the very first president of the United States, who was a godly Christian man. His last words, as the doctor was in the room with him, the doctor was speaking with him. It is said that he grabbed the hand of his doctor and he looked into his eyes and said, Doctor, I am dying, but I'm not afraid to die. I can tell you also the last words of a man named Voltaire. He says, I'm making a fearful leap into the dark. It was Hobbes also an atheist who says, I have been rejected by God and man. I'm going to hell. Those were his last words. But I can't end the sermon with hell on your mind. So I'm going to tell you what Paul says. As they were sharpening the Roman guillotine outside his cell, and he knew his time was up, he was going to die, he picked up his pen and wrote his last words to his son Timothy, saying, Timothy, you know what? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me, not only for me, but all those that love his appearing. That's what God wants you to have. Hallelujah. you today can I pray for you can I invite you to bow your hearts with me I want to pray for you father God almighty I ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to reach into every home and every heart and touch the lives and the hearts of men and today we will recognize the only duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments I ask you, Lord, please, for the intervention of your Holy Spirit, for no one can come to the Father unless they're drawn by the power of the Spirit of God. I beg you, God, for your intervention today. And now, my brother, my sister, whoever you are, wherever you are, I would like you to say this prayer after me in your heart. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. And I ask you, please, to come into my life. Come into my heart. Remove everything in my life that does not please you. 
Today, I say like David, I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my faults and my sin is always before me. I think about it. And today, I want to be free from this. So I bring my sins, I bring my faults, and I lay them at your cross. And I beg you to have mercy upon me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And for his glory. Wash my sins away. Make me yours, O oh God. I beg you in Jesus' name. Thank you for praying that prayer. And if you did, and I know you did, remember what the Word of God says. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen? From today on, it's a new beginning. It's a new life. And watch how God will make you happy. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'm glad you're here. And we are going to have Holy Communion today. I would like to ask those of you at home uh, if you can prepare some wine, prepare a piece of bread or crackers, whatever you have. Just prepare it. Reach into your refrigerator. Get something to drink. Get some bread from the cupboard, whatever, you, and just bring it, put it aside. Put it in the middle of your living room. Gather the family together. We're going to share communion together. Amen. I want to ask God to bless the elements and bless your life. Our ushers are coming. We're going to serve those who are in the sanctuary. If there are any in the parking lot, please help us share with them as well. And uh, go ahead and raise a song for us, please, while we're getting the elements ready. ask the Lord to bless these elements so that they will be a representation of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his shed blood. This one event, this single event is what changed our world. It changed our world. It changed our world. And it can change your life. Father God Almighty, I ask you please to bless this bread. Let it be a representation of your broken body. Bless also the cup. Let it be a representation of your shed blood that together as we partake of this in remembrance of you, we will partake healing, deliverance, and blessing, and transformation. And the greatest healing of all, the healing of the soul. That souls will be saved and lives will be changed. And today as we share in this great event, that is exactly what we do today. In taking part in this communion, we are sharing in the greatest event of all. And that is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless this, O oh Lord, I ask. And bless those in their homes, on their jobs, wherever they may be, in the car, as they are about to share in this precious moment. Bless the elements in their rooms, in their hands. And let that also be a transformation into the broken body.
the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name. so much uh, worship ministry appreciate you today our Lord Jesus Christ the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat for this is my body which is broken for you would you eat it in Jesus name after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this is the cup of the New Testament of my blood. As often as you drink this cup, you do show forth my death, the Lord says, until I come. Will you drink it today in Jesus' name? Today, as we take part in this very precious sacrament, the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take a moment to pray. Let's take a moment to reflect on the goodness of God and ask of him anything you need. Anything. Mark 11, 24. And Mark 11, 4, 24 and 11, 23. The Lord asks us to ask for anything whatsoever we desire. Father God Almighty, I ask you today that you remember those who stand in need of healing, those who stand in need of deliverance, those who stand in need of happiness, peace of mind, joy, blessings, prosperity, those who stand in need of forgiveness and reconciliation, those who stand in need of restoration, I ask you, Lord, please, to look down upon us 
in our need and by the power of your shed blood and your broken body I apply both of these into our lives and we receive the blessing at your hand in Jesus name Amen. Amen. praise the Lord before we have the benediction we have a very important announcement to make I'd like to ask Sister Arlene Johnson to come and make that announcement God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Hallelujah. 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 This weekend coming up is Valentine's Day. And we know that sometimes we often say that it's a commercialized holiday. We don't believe in it. We don't want to celebrate it. But one thing we ought to remember is that though the holiday was instituted by man, what it celebrates was instituted by God. God instituted love, and the very second thing that he instituted after he instituted the day of rest was marriage, when he brought Adam and Eve together. So we want to take the time this weekend on Saturday at 7 p.m. to celebrate love and to celebrate marriage. So on Saturday, this Saturday at 7 p.m., we will be having a Zoom Valentine's Day dinner. For more information, please reach out to Dr. Rose and we will send you the information to join us on Zoom. It doesn't cost anything. The only thing we're asking for is a love offering for us to be able to bless the speaker. We're going to have a special speaker. We're going to have special musical guests and we're just going to have a, a time of fellowship and joy. I'd like to also take this opportunity to remind everyone that last Monday and Thursday, we started with the Ebenezer Bible Institute. Now this school is a school that is near and dear to my heart because I'm a fellow graduate of EBI and I would not be standing right here doing anything, ministering to the Lord in his sanctuary right now, if not for what I learned in EBI because this scares me. This is fearful to me, but what I've learned through EBI and what I've learned through fellowship with the Holy Spirit is that we have a responsibility to be here and to minister with the Lord. So join us this Monday um, for our first class homiletics and also for our class on Thursday at 7 p.m. For more information, please reach out to our email address at ebiassignments at gmail.com. And now, Pastor, with the benediction. Praise the Lord today. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the comfort, the rest remain, and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Happy Sunday. Happy the rest of your life. God bless you. Whether you've been saved for years or just want to know more about God, we are praying for you and we bless God for you. We go live every Sunday. Subscribe now and never miss a service. Down in the description box, you can go to our website and learn about news and events and giving online. You can follow us on all our social media platforms too. We love you, stay safe, and God bless you.